move on to the second one, which is treating the patients. And most of us would use statins in high-risk patients, right? So the question is, are they for everyone? And the answer is probably yes for most of the patients that you're going to see. Particularly as they get older, the answer is yes. The question is, is there harm to them? And this is what your patients are going to ask you, because Dr. Google is going to give them all of the downsides <laughs> to taking statins. And your job is to tell them that the benefits outweigh the risks. So are they for everyone? The answer is yes, but it depends on your risk. And I'll show you the ACCAHA recommendations for appropriate first-line therapy with statins and the intensity based on your risk. And most patients will, in these groups, tolerate the appropriate intensity and dose of a statin. However, there are side effects, there are potential harms, and you need to be aware of them, and that's what I'm going to discuss. First one is statin-associated muscle symptoms called SAMs. This is the most common complaint patients may have if they take a statin. We'll go over that. New onset diabetes is a risk. It is there. It probably does relate to statin use. I'll go over that. Question is, do statins make you dumb? And the answer is no, they, they don't. We'll go over the evidence for that. And the last is liver. Sometimes docs are still concerned about the liver. I'll tell you, I can dismiss that. I'm not going to talk about it because statins do not cause hepatic necrosis. They cause maybe a little transaminitis. In other words, ALT will go up. But actually, in the, in the liver literature here in the last year or two, they found that statin use in non-alcoholic fatty liver disease in NASH actually delays fibrosis progression. So actually, statins may actually be good in patients that have underlying fatty liver. So I think we can put the liver thing aside for you and your patients. OK, so are there benefit groups for patients to take a statin? Absolutely. And the AHACC said there are four groups. First is clear. Patients with established cardiovascular disease, they should be on high-intensity statin, as high intensity as they can take for the rest of their life. The next three are primary prevention patient groups. These are the ones you're going to see because they're not seeing the cardiologist necessarily. This one is patients who inherit high LDL cholesterol. This is called familial hypercholesterolemia. It's very clear. They inherit it from the day they're born. Their LDLs are 200 milligrams per deciliter or higher for their entire life. And it's not because they eat. I can't tell you the number of patients that we see with premature heart disease who had an LDL of 300. And they, uh, you know, at 40 years old, you say, didn't, some, didn't anybody tell you your cholesterol was high? Oh, yeah, yeah, they told me it was high, but it was my diet. Look, you know, you can't eat your, you cannot eat your way to a LDL of 300. Okay, you inherit that, right? So you need to treat those patients early if you identify them. In individuals with diabetes over the age of 40 and LDLs above 70, yes, even if they don't have heart disease, they should be on a statin, at least moderate intensity. Uh, could be high intensity if they're higher risk, more complicated diabetics. And last but not least, are the, the purest primary prevention, no heart disease, no diabetes, over the age of 40, LDLs above 70, but their pooled risk cohort equations are high enough for you to talk about a long-term strategy for preventing heart disease with at least a moderate intensity statin. So those are the patients who should be taking statins, and that's pretty much everybody after the age of 40 and certainly after 50 or 60. But in the next slide, I want to look at, uh, if I can get this to work, the statin-associated muscle symptoms. This is a collection of muscle-related complaints you'll hear from patients. It's either going to be ache, sore, stiff, tender, weak, or cramping, right? Or any mixture of those, right? And the cramping usually is with or, with it, with or after exercise. So, you know, they're usually, it's tough because the definitions are not standardized as to what a statin does. Usually, they're symmetrical. You know, a patient who's got, you know, a calcific bursitis in their shoulder, statins aren't going to make that shoulder worse, okay? But they're usually symmetrical complaints. They usually will resolve with discontinuation of the statin and recur if you rechallenge. It'll be the same set of symptoms. That's usually sort of the way we try to, to define it. And a high CK or CPK is not necessary to make a diagnosis. So don't go chasing CKs to say, oh, this is related to the statin, because it's not necessarily related. So the spectrum, the National Lipid Association and their safety uh, task force on statins, sort of put it this way, there's myalgia, which is the most common. It's, it's an unexplained muscle discomfort that has normal CKs. You know, I just ache, I just feel this, you know. 
But myopathy is that with some weakness. And there are some patients who will say, I have difficulty climbing stairs or getting up out of a chair since I've been taking the statin. So there is some focal muscle weakness that may have with the myalgia. Myositis is more muscle inflammation. And that can be tenderness with touch and usually is associated with a high CK. And then the worst and the least likely to happen is actual rhabdomyolysis, myonecrosis. Very, very uncommon. So what's the incidence? Well, in randomized clinical trials, it's very low. Uh, in PRIMO study, this was an observational study in France. It was 11%. Randomized trials is less than 5%. More recent observational studies looking at populations uh, said it may be as high as 20%. But I'll just show you that if you go to randomized trials and, and put patients in who have symptoms and said they're intolerant, the STOP study showed it was 10% when patients agreed to either take a torvastatin or placebo. They didn't know what they were going to get, but they agreed to enter the trial. And when they gave them the drug, they, it, the, the instance was 10% of those patients who said they were statin intolerant actually got it right with being on the statin with a, with a complaint. And then it usually occurs early, and it uh, discontinues, it stops as early. So it's patients who say, I, I suddenly got muscle symptoms two years after taking a statin, probably isn't the statin. It's temporally related to taking it. There's an interesting trial looking at the, some of the newer drugs for, for cholesterol lowering, the monoclonal antibodies, alirocumab. They looked at statin intolerant patients, and they were required to enroll in this trial to have a six week run in, even though they were statin intolerant, to see if they could take a torvastatin 20 milligrams. They knew they were going to take it, and 78% could tolerate it for six weeks. Then they were enrolled in the trial, and then they were either added these drugs but continued on a torvastatin. If they went longer than six weeks and the trial was 24 weeks, more and more patients complained of muscle symptoms. So it does tend to go up with time. They knew they were taking a statin, and so that's, that's part of the issue. I will say that um, another one of the trials, very interesting, the GAUS-3 trial was patients who were intolerant to more than two statins, and they were agreed to undergo a torvastatin 20 or placebo in a crossover design for 24 weeks. 43% of the patients got it right. They knew when they were taking a statin and when they were on placebo. 27% only got the symptoms on placebo and not when they were taking a torvastatin. And the remaining 30% missed it on the crossover. They got it right the first time, got it wrong the second time. Right? So this goes to show you how difficult it is to decide what is true statin intolerance because the patients, if they don't know what they're taking, sometimes won't get it right. So the nocebo effect comes in here because we don't do stat, we don't do placebo control trials in the in, in our office. We give them a prescription for a statin. Well, I you're gonna get a side effect if you know you're taking it and you know that Dr. Google tells you you can get it, you might. So that's the nocebo effect. I'll tell you that the nocebo effect is probably true. This just came out in Lancet uh, last month. This was a long-term trial that uh, that they looked at the benefits in primary prevention of atorvastatin or placebo. For three and a half years, the benefit was, was there for taking atorvastatin over placebo. Post-trial follow-up, they allowed patients to take unblinded atorvastatin, and the follow-up was for another two and a half years. And what they found is that there was no difference during the blinded trial, so patients who were on placebo or atorvastatin, there was no difference in muscle symptoms for three and a half years. When the trial stopped, they offered patients, now you can take the medicine. You know the trial's positive, you can take it. So the patient didn't know what they were taking before. Would you like to take the medicine now? So they did it for two and a half years. And guess what? 40% of patients said they had muscle symptoms. And there was no difference during the blinded, a blinded trial. So the, the question is, when you know you're taking the medicine, sometimes it does sort of precipitate some issues. So just keep the nocebo effect in, uh, in mind on some of your patients with this. Risk factors for SAMS, higher age, female, Asian descent, and low BMI. We're not sure why that's the case, but for the Asian descent, it has something to do with genetics, which codes for the uptake of statins in the liver, sloco one b one They tend to have a higher incidence of a defect in that that, uh, in, that decreases hepatic uptake. There are drug-drug interactions that increase statin exposure. Some of those are with uh, HIV drugs, for instance, and neoterone, uh, calcium channel blockers. Uh, inflammatory myopathy history, so patients with chronic inflammatory diseases tend to be more likely to have symptoms. CKD patients are more likely. And maybe very, very low vitamin D might increase the risk for SAMS. I know there are myalgia scores you can use that were published a few years ago. 
looking at regional distribution, temporal pattern, and challenge and de-challenge. The more likely they are to be symmetrical, related to taking the statin sooner than later, and going away and coming back with re-challenge are all strongly indicated that there is a relationship to the statin. And how to manage? Well, they're non-statin drugs. You can use PCSK9 inhibitors, uh, the monoclonal antibodies, bile acid resins, old-timey drugs when I started 35 years ago, and ezetimibe, which is generic now as a cholesterol absorption inhibitor. They all work to lower LDL and very effective. I suggest you try alternate day dosing. A longer acting statins like rosuvastatin and atorvastatin can be given once a week or three times a week every other day. It's amazing how patients can tolerate that kind of schedule. Um, and I think trying all available statins, some people forget that there's things like fluvastatin, pravastatin, patavastatin, or other statins. You know, try them. Uh, sometimes patients will sort of say, oh, wow, okay. Um, and they'll try to look it up like, oh, I see there's nothing in Dr. Google about this particular statin causing a problem. Well, that's because they're not used that much. So they won't find anything and they'll go, oh, okay, so maybe I can tolerate this one. CoQ10 doesn't help myalgias. They've done randomized clinical trials and it doesn't help. There is probably some benefit in vitamin D replacement if it's very, very low. If it's borderline, it's probably not going to help. But if it's very low, it may very well help. I do want to talk about diabetes. Uh, interestingly, uh, this was 23 years ago. The West of Scotland study primary prevention trial was a positive trial, one of the first ones to show benefits of using a statin in a primary prevention population. So in a very short period of time, they showed benefit. And this was a long-term follow-up uh, showing the continued benefit of patients who were treated early tended to have a legacy effect. Bottom line was West of Scotland said that taking pravastatin, that's what the statin in this trial was, lowered your risk of diabetes by 30%. However, it didn't actually lower the risk. When they looked at the long-term follow-up, it didn't tend to persist. The cardiovascular benefits persisted, but this prevention of diabetes that they thought was happening really doesn't happen. So the question is, do you have a risk of diabetes from taking a statin? Well, it was uh, about 10 years ago, the Jupiter trial, very positive primary prevention trial with rosuvastatin 20 milligrams, said there was a 25% higher risk of diabetes taking rosuvastatin over placebo. And after that publication, there came several meta-analyses suggesting that there was a risk, not 25%, but between 9 and 13% higher risk of cardiovascular, I mean of, of diabetes, new onset diabetes from taking a statin. So everybody's like, wow, okay, do statins cause diabetes? We thought maybe they might reduce the risk, but do they cause it? Well, in Journal of American College of Cardiology, they were back up to 35% risk again of taking a statin. This was from three trials using a torvastatin, and they looked at new-onset diabetes. And the reason it was higher is because the risk is definitely higher if patients have prediabetes. So if they're on the road taking the steps towards diabetes, they have insulin resistance, statins may push them. They found that if you did not have metabolic syndrome, you didn't have a risk of diabetes taking a statin. And that was subsequently shown in another trials, set of trials in the uh, in American Journal of Cardiology. The predisposition to diabetes is higher in those who have higher baseline fasting blood sugar, higher triglycerides, and higher BMI. Now, the only outlier came out uh, last year in the New England Journal. This was HOPE-3. This was in older patients, looking at primary prevention in older patients with rosuvastatin at a lower dose, 10 milligrams. It worked to reduce cardiovascular disease, but interestingly, did not change the incidence of diabetes in older patients. So it was the only outlier, but most of these uh, studies do suggest that the more metabolic syndrome risk factors you have, the more likely you are to get diabetes with a statin. Right? So the bottom line is those patients probably need lifestyle treatment a lot more with their statin if you're going to try to prevent cardiovascular disease. Don't worry about the diabetes. I'm not going to go over this. I just wanted to put this in here that there's some suggestions that some of the genes that relate to lowering LDL that statins work on, like HMG-CoA reductase, may actually be associated with a higher risk of diabetes. So there's some genetic thing going on there that may be associated with this, but I will say in the next slide that 
there is some evidence that statins may have a direct effect on insulin sensitivity or maybe beta cell dysfunction or apoptosis. There's a possibility. So I just want to keep, have you keep that in mind. Still need a little bit more research on that. But it does look like if you're on the road with metabolic syndrome, just be more cautious about lifestyle changes. Don't stop the statin to prevent diabetes. They're on the road anyway. You need to be doing other things to prevent diabetes, not stopping a very effective medicine like statins. So do they cause diabetes? The reality is, yes, they probably do, modest increase. And the benefits far outweigh the risks. And I would say that the available data would say, give it to them, focus on lifestyle treatment. We just need to learn more about what the positive and negative effects are of statins on insulin secretory processes. Now, the next thing is cognitive risk. It's a lot of information here. The question is whether statins reduce cognition by themselves or whether they do it because they lower LDL. And remember that cholesterol is really important for neurologic function, brain function, neurotransmission. But the question is, is there any evidence that they cause cognitive harm? And so far, there is a lot of data suggesting that there is no effect of statins on cognitive function. They certainly do not cause decline looking at cognitive testing. The HOPE 3, I told you, was in older patients with primary prevention. Not only was there no harm, unfortunately, there was no benefit. That was the other part we were hoping with statins, that it might delay dementia. It reduces stroke, statins do, but why doesn't it reduce dementia if it reduces vascular strokes and so forth? Well, don't know. It doesn't harm you, but it doesn't really help you either. The Ebbinghaus study was presented at ACC a few months ago. This was a study uh, using a, a monoclonal antibody to PCSK9. It showed no decline or benefit in standardized cognitive testing with low LDL. The mean LDL in this study was 30 on treatment. So low LDL doesn't help you, and it doesn't harm you. So I, I don't think you can, you can put it to rest, the idea that patients will have harm from taking a statin or from having low LDL. I will say that you know, while cholesterol is, is important to cellular functions, there's no evidence that lowering LDL impairs the ability of the body to do any of these things, steroid hormone synthesis or the intestinal function or even brain function. We have a lot of uh, evidence from patients who have rare, relatively rare lipid disorders with low LDL. They inherit tendencies for low LDLs in the 20s, 30s, and 40s. They have a normal life. They live long lives, no cancer, no dementia, and normal steroid function everything. So uh, don't worry about the low LDL. Lastly, in summary, statin intolerance is complicated. It's mostly due to statin muscle symptoms, but it could be due to other issues, one of which I brought up was a nocebo effect. I would try several statins, alternate day, once a week, if you have patients with SAMs, and consider non-statin drugs if they're very high risk. Harms are real, and they're mostly related to new onset diabetes, but the benefits outweigh the risks, and I would minimize any progression in the predisposed to diabetes through lifestyle changes, weight loss, and exercise, and continue to use a very effective treatment like statins. And lastly, what is a low LDL is not really clear for harm, but certainly levels above 20 appear to be safe, so I don't think you should worry about that. I thank you very much for, uh, for your attention. Hopefully there's a lot of information. We'll have a discussion later. Thanks.